Well, thanks for doing this, Maddie. I really appreciate it. So Maddie, for anyone who doesn't know her, I'm going to put obviously a full description, but I'll let you introduce yourself as well um, so I don't make anything wrong. But you're from an organisation called Little Dreamers and this podcast is about sharing stories of children and young people and adults who have had a parent with a, um, a, mental, a mental illness, right? So when I saw your organisation, I, I know a bit about Satellite Foundation Victoria, yep. but then I saw your organisation on Instagram. It's not only kids who have a parent with a mental illness. It goes beyond that. It's the full... Um, gamut of young carers. So maybe do you want to talk about your lived experience yourself and then what made you um, then start the Little Dreamers organisation? Definitely. Thank you so much for having me. I, um, I'm so excited to be here and um, to be able to, to talk to you about this and it is such an important conversation to have so I just I just wanted to um, acknowledge that as well. Um, so, um, oh, sorry, it says can't answer your video. Hold on. Is that, yeah, it's that right. still work? It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's going okay. So basically, because we're recording over um, the internet, it can be a bit laggy and stuff like that. But um, post-recording, it'll be fine. It'll be like high okay. def. It just bugs around whilst we're doing it, unfortunately. So it's saying okay. it's storage full on your computer, apparently, but I don't think it sh- should really matter. Okay. So yeah. sorry about that. No, no, it's I'll, not your fault. I can, um, I'll start that again. Just to say. Um, anyway. Yeah. Um, Thank you so much for having me. I'm I'm super excited to be here, and I think having these conversations is incredibly important. So thank you for for shining a light on on young carers and on lived experience and mental health. Um, as as you mentioned, I grew up as a young carer, so I grew up as a young carer for both my brother and my mum. My brother has a range of chronic health conditions and learning difficulties um, and has a range of allergies as well. So he's allergic to dairy, egg, soy, lavender, kiwi, fruits, walnuts and wool. Um, And he's also um, grown up with asthma and adrenal insufficiency, fibromyalgia, encephalitis and epilepsy. So um, he had a very poor immune system and was in and out of hospital a lot uh, when he was younger. And then when I was 14 years old, um, started caring for my mum as well. So my mum Uh, was diagnosed with breast cancer. She was very, very young. Um, And then she went through all of the treatments that come through that or come with that. She uh, lost her hair with chemotherapy and um, has been left with rheumatoid arthritis in her hands and her feet and osteoporosis as well. Um, And I have also, I mean, I've done all of my caring alongside my dad, but um, have also supported supported him and supported my mum and my brother at different times with their mental health as well. So as someone who has grown up with anxiety as well, it's there's lots of different layers, I guess. Hmm. It must have been extremely tough. And um, so then what? Well, when, when did you decide or what was, going back to when you were growing up, what support was then offered for you or, you know, when you were going through this situation, was there anywhere you could turn to or what happened from your perspective? Yeah. So growing up, I there wasn't a huge amount of direct support. I was supported by an organization called CareNet, which isn't around anymore, but it was kind of like a big brother, big sister program. Um, so I, they called them co-pilots. So I had a co-pilot, her name was Angie, um, and she used to come over and hang out with me and help me with my homework. And um, we made a mosaic mirror at one point, so lots of arts and crafts and that kind of stuff. Um, and that was really special for me. Um, but other than that, there was no real support for me as a young carer. I mean, I didn't even know what the term young carer meant when I was yeah. younger. So um, I, I think that a lot of the time I felt quite overlooked and isolated, um, but also felt quite guilty for feeling that way when I wasn't the sick one in my family. I felt like, why why should I deserve attention? Why should I need extra support? I'm healthy. And so I think that was something that I went through a lot when I was a kid as well. Yeah, I read one of the reports on your website, which was the um, the Griffith University one. Yeah, it said a lot of people, a lot of kids in our situation would not even identify that term young carer, right? It's just their normal, this is my circumstance, this is my parent, and this is, you know, I love them all. It's my family member, this is what I just do, right? So to even have that term young carer and then to even, as you said, the self-esteem thing to then believe or you're worthy of, let's say, all this good stuff happening to you as well um, is, is quite a common problem. Yeah, yeah, definitely a common problem. I think that, I mean... Even now, the I call myself a young carer because it relates to my work and because it's an easily understandable term for the people who aren't carers, I guess. You're a young person, you provide care, it makes sense. I think it's tricky when you're a young person providing care yourself because often a lot of the time there are people in your family who have a lot of labels on them, whether it is a mental health 
label or whether it's a disability or an illness or an addiction or whatever it might be that I didn't want when I was younger to have a label myself. I was like, well, everyone else in my family has that. Why do I need a label too? And I feel like that's something that we struggle with, with working with young carers and what young carers struggle with themselves is around that recognition and identification piece. But also because at least for me growing up, I didn't think I was doing anything different or unusual. I kind of just assumed that everyone knew their way around a hospital ward and everyone knew how to get the best snacks at a hospital and everyone knew how to call an ambulance. I didn't realize that that was something that was unusual to my peers. And I I think because of that, it meant that there were a lot of things that I didn't feel like I needed to access or I didn't know about too. Mm -hmm. Well, how did it go with dealing with, you know, being at school and things like that, that sort of you've got this stuff going at home. So how did you manage to, to work your way through being growing up through school? As we know, all adolescent years can be very tough as it is in normal circumstances, but to have this going on as well, plus school, um, how was that for you? I was really badly bullied at school. Um, I think it came from a combination of my brother was really different. I was always looking after him. We went to the same school and so people knew that that he required a lot of extra support in the classroom and things like that. And I was often standing up for him. My family was not wealthy. We, we struggled financially. And so there were a lot of things that we couldn't do um, or we couldn't afford to do. And so um, I was really badly bullied for being different. I think that my values growing up were also different. So I, instead of wanting to go out and hang out with my friends and do all of that kind of stuff. I often wanted to stay home to make sure I was there to provide the care that needed to be provided to my family. So I think that like, I think I struggled socially at school, but educationally, I guess I I was very lucky. I'm, I'm good with books. I love reading. I think, you know, my marks were always really good, except for the fact that I used to lie a lot at school. And I think that came from wanting attention. Um, I didn't get a lot of attention at home because of my brother. And so I used to make up these extraordinary lies and tell incredibly tall tales at school. And I tried to pass off um, a plastic um, platypus one year for a school project saying that I'd made it. Um, And I got in so much trouble, but it said made in China on the bottom of it. So I definitely (laughs) didn't make it myself. But um, yeah, I think educationally I was okay, but socially I really struggled at school. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that because... um... Because what people don't realise, bullying obviously in general is bad, right? Obviously, if, but to have the all situation going on and then to have kids still, you know, you've got that bullying stuff at school, then you've got to try and succeed is what you're doing. It's just a very, very tough existence. And I don't think a lot of people understand with people who have uh, young carers and stuff, if they are bullied, for example, just to have that bloody extra level of um, <laughs> unnecessary problems in their life and, you know, it's almost like it's very tough for the kids because you don't want to go and tell the teachers because then you get, you know, labelled a snitch or whatever it is. Yeah. And then, but you've got to then deal with all this other stuff. It's just, it's just this whole big melting pot of just, just dramas. And then you've got to succeed at school. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and I grew up with really bad anxiety, and and a lot of young carers do have anxiety and things like that. And so, throw in a caring role, bullying insane amounts of anxiety and you've got yeah kind of like a disaster waiting to happen <laughs> well what did you do for yourself then personally was it like a you into an instrument or what did you do yourself to take yourself out of that oh I wish I was musical um mm. I I used to read a lot um and I listened to a lot of music um I find that listening to music still today is a, a really big escape for me and um my cd collection was next level when I was younger and um, same with the books that I used to read. And so that was kind of um, what I would do to escape. And I also used to dance. So I was a dancer growing up, not a very good one, but um, I used to go to dance classes as well. So um, that was that was kind of what I used to do for myself. So then how did you come about founding um, Little Dreamers? Was it just something where you saw a gap, like, you know, I didn't have this support. I'm like, I'm actually going to do some, something about it. Or how did it all come about? Yeah, so it definitely was finding a gap. So I originally, it was originally called the CareNet Kids Club. So CareNet, the organisation that I was supported by, um, there was three of us, me and two of my best friends who founded the CareNet Kids Club. We wanted to uh, fundraise and, and run events for to raise money to make sure that every 
child who had a sick sibling was able to access a co-pilot. Um, and we ran a couple of events. So we actually started fundraising when we were nine years old and it's 20 years this year in July since our very first fundraiser. Um, and we ran a whole range of different fundraisers from parties at the Hard Rock Cafe through to uh, movie nights. And um, we had a sports clinic with the Harlem Globetrotters. Um, and then from there, uh, it kind of just spiraled. So we wanted to then start raising money for other organizations other than just CareNet. So then we became the kids club, but it was KIDZ because it was the early 2000s and we were really cool. Um, <laughs> and, um, and it stood for caring, independent, dedicated siblings, but caring with a K and siblings with a Z um, yeah. because, yeah, it was the early 2000s. Um, and then um, when my mum got sick um, in 2007, we there was kind of a few people in the original kids club that had dropped out. They it wasn't a passion for them and that that's totally fine. We were young. Um, and there was three of us that joined a competition called Youth Inspire, which was um, how do young people come up with an idea that would change the world? And we, it was the first and only time I've ever written a business plan. Um, <laughs> but we, we pitched this idea for an organization called Little Dreamers um, that supported at the time siblings of sick kids um, and then it kind of just grew from there. So we launched in 2009 and it's 13 years this year since we launched and we only launched with one program and all volunteers. And now, um, my two co-founders have, um, left the organization. They left quite a while ago, um, to pursue other interests and they're incredibly successful. Um, and yeah, now we run eight different core support programs and, have a team of 50 staff working with about six and a half thousand kids per year right around the country, which is pretty exciting. That's bloody amazing. Like, um, I looked at, obviously I looked in the website and all stuff and I saw how many staff you have. And that was one of my question was, how did you, how, like just building the, obviously it's 13 years is a, is a, is a long time, but it's also a very short time, right? To, to yep. do what you've done. And so how was, how was those early days? Was it something where you wrote a business plan for this, but like, How's it evolved, like especially in the early days? Because there'd be a lot of people who want to do what you've done but just don't know how to, to sort of maybe get started or do it. So do you recall those early days and what did you do then? Yeah, definitely. Um, it was all in my bedroom. So um, I had a two- So most businesses start. Everything starts out of it. Right. So I think yeah. the first piece of office furniture I ever bought was a blue two-drawer filing cabinet because I thought that, you know, professionals have filing cabinets. I had nothing to put in it. Um, and now in our office now, we have that blue two drawer filing cabinet and still there are no files in it. I think we use it to store excess tech equipment. Um, but everyone keeps wanting me to get rid of it. And I keep saying, no, this blue two drawer filing cabinet will be with me until the day I die. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, in the early days, it was really tough. We, we just kind of Googled everything. Um, and we ran a lot of fundraising events, um, I remember printing off a huge amount of papers around how do you register an ABN and what is an ABN and why do I need one? Mm -hmm. um, so I, it was a lot of Googling and a lot of asking other people. And we started with one program, which was our dream experience program. So a lot like Starlight and Make-A-Wish, uh, we gave young carers the opportunity to do something they've always wanted to do, but never been able to organize or afford. And our very first dream experience was um, a overnight hotel stay in the city for two sisters and they got to go in a pink Hummer limousine to the hotel and they had a big lunch at the hotel and we've done overnight stays at the Melbourne Zoo and hot air balloon rides and um, and we did that for probably like four years. All we did were dream experiences um, and then we started to add in a Young Carers Festival once a year um, and then we added in a school holiday program. And then from there, our the numbers of young carers we were supporting started to grow. We started to look for actual funding. So all of our funding right up until 2017, it all came from um, donations and, and fundraising events. And I remember sitting around the kitchen table one night with our board of directors and asking them to borrow some money because we couldn't afford to pay our insurance for the year. Mm -hmm. So 
it was really, really tough and we were all volunteers. Um, and yeah, it wasn't until 2017 that we started to re receive some recognition for what we were doing. And um, I received quite a big award, which came with a lot of media attention, which was beautiful because then all of a sudden we started getting some donations. Um, we received our tax deductibility status, which we were knocked back for a couple of times. So that was a process as well. Mm -hmm. And then received our first big government funding grant. And it wasn't that big, but it felt big for us um, in 2018, which allowed us to start employing staff. So I became a full-time employee of the organisation in 2017 and then employed our second staff member in 2018. By the end of 2018, we had five of us. And then by the beginning of 2020, there was 12. And then, yeah, 2022, halfway through, we've got 50 staff now. So it's grown really quickly and it comes off the back of um, some really cool fee-for-service things that we're doing with the federal government with their National Carer Gateway Program. So mm. that's allowed us to grow a little bit, but also it's been us being really innovative about where we're finding our funding and our fundraising events and our relationship building with our donors as well. Now, where, what was your award? Because it's a pretty big award. What do you want to tell, say what it was? Oh, I'm um, not going to let you gloss over that. I received a, um, a Queen's Young Leaders Award. So the Queen's Young Leaders Program was um, a four-year program um, that uh, Queen Elizabeth did in honour of her Diamond Jubilee. So I don't know, is that 70 years or something like that? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, she did four years where she um, awarded scholarships and, and prizes to um, young people around the Commonwealth who were doing great things in their local community. So I was part of the 2017 Queen Young, Queen's Young Leaders Program. Um, there were three of us from Australia and we got to do um, a course with Cambridge University by distance all around leading change. And then we were flown to London um, to do a 10-day residential program at Cambridge University and in London, um, meeting incredible entrepreneurs and, and learning from the best in the business. But also we got to finish our program with... Um, going into Buckingham Palace and we received a, an award medal from Queen Elizabeth herself. And then I was lucky enough to um, sit next to Prince Harry at the dinner um, after the award ceremony. So that was probably one of the best experiences of my life. Because it's an OIM, isn't it? The little, uh, OIM, the little... Yeah, yeah, so that yeah. was separate. So I received my okay. Order of Australia medal in um, 2019. So that that was, I think, off the back of a lot of the recognition that we were getting from the Queen's Young Leaders Program, but also, I guess, Australian recognition of um, the work that, that I've been able to do with young carers. So that's pretty cool because now I have three letters at the end of yeah. my name, which makes me oh, feel really fancy. <laughs> I think it's brilliant. I think it's fantastic. And um, I just think it's it's unbelievable. But what people don't realise is you've had to do that, let's say, seven or eight years before you've even got a, a funding. Like I know talking from Rose from Satellite, it was 10 years before she got the um, the funding from the Victorian government based on the Royal Commission into Mental Health. So yeah. people don't realise how much of a passion and graft it's, you know, it's not a startup where you might have to do hard graft for two years and you start making some money. Seven or eight years or even 10 years in Rose's case where you have to, every day you're like, you're just dedicating to yourself and it just make, it must make you feel so good because you just don't know, you know, you could go for another couple of years before anything happens. It's just um, must make you feel really proud that, you know, what you've been able to achieve. Yeah, yeah, it definitely does. And I think it can be quite frustrating when you're in the thick of it and you're kind of like, I have thousands of young people that I'm supporting every year. Why don't, why doesn't the government recognise that these young people need support? Why doesn't the community yeah. recognise it? So it, it can be quite frustrating, yeah, when you're in the middle of it. But um, when you're, when, when you look back and kind of lift your head up out of the work and you look back at how far you've come, it, it is something that I'm very, very proud of. Well, how did you show your impact? Because this is a problem I know um, satellite, well, they have to do this to get with funding. Like, how do you measure impact of your programs? Like, Because if you have a young person who comes in at the age of six or whatever, and the way I sort of look at it, you know, it's sort of like, well, six-year-old who didn't have any support or intervention at all, where a six-year-old going to your program, you know, what's the two sort of, you know, what's the two sort of trying to imagine or project what would their lives be like, right? So how do you show the impact um, of the Little Dreams programs and everything you do with the people to, just to help with the government in regards to funding and things like that? 
Yeah, great question. So we um, we utilize an impact measurement and evaluation framework called the Outcome Star Framework. So um, we do a, um, a star assessment called the My Mind Star at the beginning when a young carer joins our program. So there are um, seven questions or seven key themes that we ask them questions about, and they're rated on a one to five or a five point scale. Um, and so we ask them all these questions at the beginning around their relationships, where they live, how they spend their time, um, all around trying to get a picture of their quality of life, I guess. Um, so we do that with the My Mind Star. And then we also have um, a survey that we send them out. Um, it's two parts. So it's one is called the PANOC, which stands for the Positive and Negative Outcomes of Caring, which measures um, what are you actually doing as part of your caring role and how are you feeling about that? So how does providing care, what are the positive outcomes of providing care for you and what are the negative? And do you sit more on the positive side of things um, or do you sit more on the negative side of things uh, when it comes to the, I guess, outcomes of your caring role? And then we also send through a survey called the MACA, which is the Multidimensional Assessment of Caring Activities, which basically puts young carers on a scale of how much care do you provide. Um, and so those three tools together, the My Mind Start, the MACA and the PANOC, they give us a really beautiful, well-rounded kind of assessment and look at where a young carer is when they come into our services. We then um, set goals with the young carer. So our family support workers will put together a support plan for our young carers uh, where they set a whole bunch of goals together and make sure that the young person is empowered um, when setting those goals. And it might be things like meet new people. It might be get a job. They can kind of range and it depends on how old the young person is when they come into our programs. Um, and then we uh, refer them into either our programs or into programs from other organisations that um, are best suited for that young person and what areas they want to work in. And then we do program-specific evaluations. So young carers will do a survey at the end of programs. Did they enjoy it? Did they not? What did they learn? All of those normal questions. And then at a six-month and 12-month mark, we redo the My Mind Star, the MACA and the PANOC as well, um, again, to see if anything has changed. And so we, the kind of those three tools give us an overview of how the young person is overall. And then we use individual program specific evaluations and surveys to see which then program is impacting that young person's quality of life in different ways and we can kind of see okay well our dream experiences provide great short short term support acknowledgement self confidence building all that kind of stuff our big dreamers program which is a 6 month personal development program for 14 to 18 year old young carers that really shifts things in terms of their mental health or their employability or um, their resilience or sense of identity. So altogether, it's kind of a, a really complicated and complex framework, but it allows us to report to the government, to our other donors about some really interesting insights as to how young carers are spending their time, what their quality of life is like and how Little Dreamers are, is supporting that. What are you finding out from it then? What, what's the sort of things you've noticed? Obviously, I know it's a positive impact, but maybe do you want to talk about any maybe specific details or a little bit, what, what are some things that are interesting things um, that's coming out of it? Yeah, definitely. So I think that the most interesting thing we're seeing is around um, which of our programs are creating that long-term sustainable shift in a young person. So we've seen an increase in engagement with education through our tutoring programs. Um, we've seen an increase in self-perceived mental health. So um, we're not asking, we're not doing, um, I guess, externally, tracked mental health assessments we're doing how do you feel about your own mm -hmm. mental health so from a lot of our kind of young carers who are 14 to 25 we're seeing real significant shifts in their own self-perceived mental health and their resilience and coping mechanisms um in our younger young carers we're seeing incredible changes in their social isolation levels so um, the fact that they're feeling more comfortable talking about their caring role, but also the fact that they know about more young people who are just like them. So mm. um, I think that's it kind of changes as they grow up and that matches with our programs get 
more um, kind of complex and longer as in terms of their engagement with different programs um, is longer as they grow up as well. And, and we work with kids as young as four years old right through to 25 and I have been very privileged over the last 13 years to be able to watch a lot of our young people grow up um, over that time and there are these two um, siblings, two boys that we've been working with for six years now and when they came to our organisation way back when um, and joined as a school holiday program, they would barely speak, they wouldn't leave each other's side um, and now they are just two of the most inspirational young men um, that I am lucky to to still have engaged in our organisation and I get to kind of sit on the sideline and, and watch how much they've grown and how talkative they are now and what their career paths might be and, and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's really special. Well, the stuff you do, and there's some couple of other organisations, but it's just like, it's just such a massive impact on, on that person's life. You literally do change those you know, young boy's life, right, if you didn't have some sort of involvement with you. And you know yourself, from each of even had that mentor. So what age did you have the mentor from the um, other organisation? I had Angie, I reckon I would have been eight until I was about 10 or 11 maybe. And, I mean, I'm 29 now and I still remember that so clearly. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, that's a massive testament to Angie and the impact that she had on my life. But, um I hope that our programs are creating the same opportunities for our young people as Angie gave me. Well, I just think it's so important to mention just the mentoring itself because um, I'm 33 and we had nothing, right? So that's what I'm real passionate about this subject. And just hearing about all these things now, knowing how much it would have made a difference in my life, it's just like, you know, wow, and how much it would have made a difference into other people's lives who might be a bit older with 40 or 50 and they're hearing this sort of stuff. And, yeah, it's just it's just remarkable how much change and how much impact your programs can do um, in, in making just better people in society who might have gone off the rails a bit or not had the same sort of guidance in life that they need. But it's not that much stuff. As you said, that mentorship you had in that eight to ten year range, it still sits with you to this day. It's just even just having a mentor role um, is, is really important. Yeah, yeah. And I, I often look at our programs and, and think, wow, if, if only I had access to something mm. like this when I was younger. So um, I definitely, I, I relate to that so much and I'm so excited that now Little Dreamers can offer that mentoring program when organisations like CanAir don't exist anymore and we can make sure that that's still an opportunity for young people. Well, let's talk about, um, I should have asked you to start, but some of the, st uh, the stats around young carers, so there's a lot more adverse um, outcomes for, for children in those scenarios. So what's some, um, some data or some stats or insights you can give around um, the, the, the problems uh, that young carers face? Yeah, definitely. So one in 10 young people grow up as a young carer. So that's roughly two to three kids in every single classroom across the country. These young people are up to 1.5 years behind in their schooling at a year nine level through, and that's measured through NAPLAN testing scores. Um, they're less engaged with their schooling and, and employment than their peers. 60% of young carers aged 15 to 24 are not engaged in work compared to 38% of non-young carers. Two out of three young carers have a mental illness of their own um, and 50% of young carers and their families live below the poverty line here in Australia. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot, of, a lot of different complex factors that all kind of roll into one very tough package for many young Australians. It is. Now, George... So you have a lot of, um, obviously you cover kids who have got a parent with a mental illness or serious mental illness as well. What are some things that you notice about, let's say, kids who have a, a parent with a mental illness? What are some things from your perspective that you see with them and the challenges they face or let's say maybe the unique characteristics they develop from having to, from living that scenario? Yeah, so about a quarter of the kids that we work with um, acknowledge that they have a parent with a mental illness and that, and I use the word acknowledge carefully because there are a lot of our families who have undiagnosed mental illness in them as well and families who have come to us with saying, okay, well, I care for my, um, I care for my brother who has autism and that's what they've come to us with but they haven't recognised or the parent hasn't recognised that they also have a mental health concern and that the child is supporting as well. So um, out of these families, I guess, there is still a lot of stigma. There is still a lot of young people not 
kind of talking about their caring role because of fear of repercussions. We have had a lot of young people ex- express to us that they don't talk about it because they are scared they're going to be taken away from their family, mm. um, especially if they're in a single parent family um, and they are providing that primary level of care. Um, and so there's lots of things that we do to work with these young people around what does the child protection system look like? How does it work? And like, how does that impact you? And a lot of the time it's just reassuring them that it's not a fear that they need to worry about with us and they can talk freely. Um, but obviously we do have mandatory reporting in place and things like that. So, um, it is a very complicated area and I think the main thing we need to do as a community and that we try and do at Little Dreamers is really break down that stigma that is still associated with caring for someone with a mental illness and, and allow them allow the carers to get the support that they need and recognise that that they need support as much as the person who they are providing care for does. Yeah, it's a really a lot of great stuff you said there because I know we start from my experience but my mum had bipolar one and she didn't really acknowledge her bipolar or, you know, if there was something like this available, she wouldn't have let me go to it anyway because there was nothing wrong with her, right? Yeah. So that's a lot of problems um, that a lot of kids face is that they have a parent who might not acknowledge their illness or, as you said, the stigma off it, they're embarrassed by it. So if there's something like this that's available for their child or the young person, they won't even let them do it, which is a big problem in itself. Yeah, and, and we've done a lot of work in that space. So we've had a lot of parents write blog posts for us to talk about how they came to terms with recognising that their child needs support um, because it is something that even my mum struggled with with recognising that I was doing things that other young people mm. wouldn't be doing or aren't expected to be doing or are tasks that are usually associated with adults. So my mum often talks about it as well in the sense that it wasn't something she thought she needed and by recognising that I needed extra support, she felt like a bit of a failure as a parent Um, and it's something I often tell her she definitely wasn't a failure as a parent but um, we've done a lot of work and we we often spend a lot of time talking with parents about recognising that their children are carers as well. Yeah, and I think it's an important point because it's um, something that is very, I would say, very common and, um, yeah, the parent would think that, you know, I'm supposed to be, looking after you yet you know you need to get this extra support so what am I doing wrong and I presume it would be it's a very probably natural thing I guess yeah yeah it is I was gonna, I'm gonna talk to you about um I've got my questions here so I am prepared with this <laughs> but um yeah as I was gonna say the um sorry I was trying to find back for you where, where was it okay so we've gone about statistics so with the with the government itself so you deal with the government and and, and all this sort of stuff so how do they look at the issue now as what they were previously? Because for me, if I'm looking at it as like a government, I'm looking at rubble. We want all of our people to be productive members of society, contributing good good families, all that sort of stuff. Whereas with young carers for us, like, you know, as we were just talking about for those two boys, right, you've probably helped two young men be really productive leaders or, you know, really big futures in society where they might not have had that. So is it something where government sort of understands that the stuff you're doing now, that sort of early intervention or early intervention guidance can have a really long tail benefit to the community, not just in regards to just a good moral thing to do, but in regards to an economic benefit as well. There's definitely a lot of work that still needs to be done from a government perspective. So, And I think if we look at a state government level versus a federal government level, they're also very different. And recognition and acknowledgement across states and territories is also very different. So uh, from a Victorian government perspective, young carers are very highly recognised. There's significant funding for young carers in the Victorian state government. Um, There's been lots of research about it um, and a lot of kind of, yeah, acknowledgement of the need for early intervention. Um, that is not the same in every other state and territory and and a lot of other states and territories are about 20 years behind in that sense. From a federal government level, they have the National Carer Gateway, which um, is a federal government initiative to provide standardised support um, for carers no matter where they live. 
it was it does include support for young carers. So Little Dreamers is a carer gateway provider across South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland. But in saying that, the system as a whole and the way it was designed was not designed with young carers in mind. So Little Dreamers has done a lot of work and, and we're very proud to be a carer gateway provider and be able to adapt the system for young carers to make it suited for them. But the way the actual initiative was designed at the beginning was not, did not include young carers, did not take into account the nuances of, of being a young person providing care. So there's still a huge amount of work that needs to be done. But I think that, I think that we're getting there. What I think we do need is cross department collaboration and cross department talking. And you need the Department of Education to be speaking with um, the new lived experience team. And you need them to be speaking with in Victoria, the Department of Families, Fairness and Housing, like there's lots of different areas that young carers overlap in. We've got aged care, disability, mental health, education, youth, all of those areas cover some part of young carers, but young carers kind of sit across the spectrum. And so what really needs to happen is to have a parliamentary standing committee on young carers to bring all of that together. It's quite a, it's quite frustrating thing that some states are 20 to 30 years behind because you would have a lot of these politicians or people who are making policy would have had this situation, right? They would have been had a parent with a mental illness. I know Greg Hunt had a mother with bipolar and disorders. He, he came out with that a couple of years ago. But there's a lot of people who can actually make the decisions who would have grown up in this scenario. So is it is it something where it's just a funding issue or is it just um, there's other political, let's say, more important things to get political wins on the board or why, why do you think that's the case? It's a really good question and I think it's because I think it's a mixture. I think it's because things like the census data that often drives a lot of funding decisions for the federal government, um, the census data does not pick up on the sheer number of young carers that there are in Australia. So the census, as you probably know, you only answer it for the carer question in particular it's only for people over the age of 15. So already you're missing out on a, a huge chunk of kids providing care. But it's also the question is, in the last two weeks, did you provide unpaid care or assistance to someone in your family because of X, Y, and Z? And like with mental health, like with mental illness, like with chronic illness, within those last two weeks, you might not have had to provide a huge amount of care because it it does it is kind of a fluctuating caring role. No two days are ever the same. Um, but also the way the question is worded often doesn't pick up on the sheer number of young people providing care. So I think there is a mixture of not enough funding, but I think because there's not enough data to back up and we have research reports which say one in 10, but because that's not the report that the government bases a lot of their funding decisions on, it it's a little bit redundant. So um, I think, yeah, I think it's a mixture of lack of recognition. I think it's a lack of acknowledgement. I think it's a bit of politicians who grew up as young carers might not call themselves a young carer. So Anthony Albanese, for example, grew up caring for his mum. He has never acknowledged that he was a young carer. He acknowledged that he was a carer. He acknowledged that around Mother's Day, it's really difficult because that's when his mum went into hospital and never came mm -hmm. out again. There's a lot of different things there, but they haven't used the term young carer and that comes down to an education piece. So I think it's a mixture of lack of funding, lack of awareness and lack of education. Yeah, and also because, as you said, a lot of young carers don't even think of themselves as young carers. So, for example, what they're doing is just normal part of their day. They're not going to go and tick a box to be, you know, that's because I don't think that's what they do as well. So you're never going to get an accurate representation of the data out there. So how can that information then get to the people who then need to make the decisions? Is it something that your organisation works on or how does it sort of getting that, what you've just said then, how can you get that into the into the minds of the, of the people who are making these decisions? In 2021, we launched the Young Care Advocacy Project. So we uh, played chicken between nationwide lockdowns and flew around the country and did um, a series of focus groups in every state and territory and ran some online and had online surveys as well to collect the ideas, feedback, information from young people providing care about what they currently spend their time doing, what do they want more of, what do they want less of, what is the Australian government or state-based government spending their money on that 
is it exactly what young carers want or need? Um, and then we, together with 16 young care ambassadors, from around the country, we put together a recommendations report that we've been talking with government around. So there are four key recommendations within that report um, around education, research, funding and program delivery um, and and recognition and things like that. So we're hoping that um, with the federal election, we're hoping that after that, no matter which party wins or loses, we're hoping that we'll be able to start getting a little bit more funding and recognition for young carers. Um, but on a state-based level, it's very much around going to talk with your local politician. Uh, we have great relationships with lots of politicians, so um, talking a lot about young carers basically to anyone who will listen and um, asking them to think about young carers in political debates that come up that might include or affect or, or have a young carer involved in them. Yeah, my frustration with the politicians is there's a lot of them, we just know statistically we would have these stories, but they just aren't willing to share them. And I just don't know uh, to the level of what they need. And that's their, that's their prerogative because that's their lived experience and that's their story to tell. Like you just love someone like, you know, Greg Hunt who did share his story once, but, you know, come on, mate, you're the federal health minister. You're in a position you can really do something for your legacy, right, um, as a champion of that sort of thing. I, yeah, I think it's around that stigma, though, and I think that it's it's a lot of people, adults, young people still feel like there's quite a bit of stigma attached to saying that you're a young carer and whatever that might be. So I think that the first thing we need to do is really break down that stigma and whether that's through a really funky nationwide awareness campaign or whether it's through word of mouth or a mixture of all of the above, I think that the first thing we need to do is really start to break down the stigma and make it okay to talk about it. And more people like you talking about your experiences and people like Greg Hunt talking about his, that will only help on that journey as well. Yeah, because that was my next question to you was about the awareness sort of thing. So what you've just mentioned a couple of things there. What from an awareness point of view can yourself or can, let's say, people who have had lived experience or young carers and maybe in a position now a bit older or to do something, what sort of, what would you advise them? Talk about it. Talk about your experience all the time. Write articles. Um, link your experience with topical things that are going on in the community. So if it's a new piece of legislation, if it's a new piece of research that's come out that you've read about in, in the paper, if it's a story on the project or on a current affair that you can relate to because it's very similar to your experience, write about it. Um, literally send it into online magazines, talk to radio shows. I What we often do is we have the radio on um, in the office or, or at home and if we hear about a carer-related story on the radio, we'll pick up the phone and call them and say, hey, have you heard about Little Dreamers? This is what we do. Um, and and so I think it's little little things that add up to big things along the way. And the more times you share your story, the more time anyone listening shares their story, the more other people will go, oh, hold on, that story is actually kind of like my story. Mm. And then they'll be like, oh, well, hold on, maybe I can get support or maybe sharing my story is important. So I think it kind of is like a snowball and ripple effect. But it's literally just sharing sharing your story encourages other people to share their story, encourages other people to share their story. And the more people who talk, the more people will realise how common it is. 100% agree. Now, I just want to talk real quickly about identification. So for me, you mentioned about all these different departments and you've got the school as well, that sort of thing, and there's all these different um, you know, people involved. But where does the identification for you really start? Is it the school who has probably the best chance of, because I know the kids may be the best, and then they, it's up to the teachers or the coordinator, whoever, right, cool, this kid's got this situation where they'd be a, a parent with a mental illness or they've got a parent with a, a, another condition. And I can refer them, is it an awareness for them to then know, well, I can go here, I can refer them here, or, or how does that sort of work from your perspective? I think identification can happen in, in lots of different spaces. So if the world was perfect and if everything worked the way it was meant to work, identification of a young carer would happen at diagnosis or at birth of the relevant person in the family. So if a GP um, diagnoses a someone with a mental illness or if a um, child ends up in hospital and is diagnosed with encephalitis like my brother or whatever it might be, 
the social worker, doctor, GP, whatever it may, might be, would at the same time as handing my parents a flyer all about epilepsy and the Epilepsy Foundation, they would also hand my parents a flyer about young carers. And they would at diagnosis, early intervention, prevention support would happen right there. Mm -hmm. The same is happening at school. So uh, we've been working really hard with the Department of Education over the last couple of years. And now um, in Victoria, there is a, a tick box on public school enrollment forms to say, do you have a caring role in your family? Yes or no. And what should be happening, which isn't happening, but what should be happening then is that schools, when they get that enrollment form, should automatically flag, okay, well, Maddie is a young carer. I'm going to link her in with wellbeing and wellbeing will be able to link her in with the relevant services. So from day dot, everyone who needs to know should know. That doesn't always happen. Um, but I think those are kind of the three key points at which people should be identified. It's not happening in practice. In practice, it is very much if someone, if the right person hears it, they'll be able to yeah. recognize it. So if if the mm. right well-being coordinator who has read an article about a carer or grew up as a carer or who knows about satellite or who knows about little dreamers hears about hears this young person's story, they're like, oh, light bulb. I'm going to refer them on to the relevant organization. But then it's about you've got the right person at the right time, not the system is right. Yeah, I just don't understand. Like when you say it sounds so logical, right, why can't it be done? Like you'd think it'd be a very, I don't know how hard it would be implemented, but logically like it sounds to me it's not a, not really an overly hard thing, right? Well, no. this kid's this situation, okay, cool. It doesn't matter if, if you've had experience or not. That should be the process. That should be the system. And the hospital thing makes absolute sense, right, because you know you can predict what's going to happen next, right? So as soon as that's done, what's the harm in just, all right, marking this family or putting them in a database or whatever it is. Yeah. So at least they're logged in the system and that, you know, whatever whatever support's in place at least knows that, all right, identification for me, from what I look at, is a big problem, right? There's families that want to talk about it. There's a lot of stigma with it, all that sort of thing. But, you know, it would just make so, life so much easier if, if, if these families or these, these kids could at least be just have in a database or something uh, from, as you said, from right from the start, it just makes, it just seems like it's a common sense thing. Yeah, and, and I mean, you think about it that any child who's diagnosed with something new is often referred to that specialist organisation. So um, every time a child goes through an assessment and is diagnosed on the autism spectrum, they're referred to a maze or they're referred to a relevant organisation because that's just the way the system works. So I don't know why they can't then automatically identify that that person is a young carer as well. Well, how do you get that message to them? Is it something where you're, when you're with this group stuff you're doing and you're going in, you're talking to these people, is this part of what you talk to them about? Or Yeah, it's all about yeah. training. So we go into universities and train um, new students, occupational therapy students, um, med students, social workers um, on identifying and, and knowing what a young carer is. We also partner with hospitals. So we partner with Monash Children's um, to ensure that their social workers know and there's the Monash Children's School as well, and we work with them. So there's lots of different kind of areas. There's lots of different areas around around that kind of stuff as well. So it's kind of it, that's kind of where we're going, but it's all about training. Yeah, but it's also volume now. Unfortunately, you've got to hit so many people with that sort of training. And I know psychiatrists for me be the big one. I'm sort of you know, sorry, I'm a bit. I'm coming through the system myself. The psychiatrists for me, and a lot of others, people that I know had no regard for her. The children or carers at all or in the in the whole thing and i know that still probably happens uh you know, i don't know too much about what happens now but from what i talk about with people from younger people it's still something where they're an afterthought um in that whole process yeah i mean i think back to when my mum was diagnosed um i i asked to come with to the doctor because my mum was going to be going through all these treatments and losing her hair and going through all these different kind of surgeries and things like that and I wanted to know how I was meant to take care of her mm. and they were just talking to my dad or to my mum directly and I, I was a young person I was a teenager in the household I was going to be involved with it and so I asked mum if I could go with to the doctor so that they could answer all my questions for me and so I, I want more of that I want yep. more of of young people being included in support planning because 
they're the ones doing the support and providing it anyway. So just include them in those conversations to begin with. 100%, Maddie. And I think it makes a massive impact because um, you will remember that you remember that disregard or that, you know, lack of involvement from the doctor deliberately. And it sort of skews your opinion of doctors moving forward. I know for me with psychiatrists and psychologists, they never included myself. And I've got a real, I've still got that real bad taste in my mouth from it because all I had to do was sit me in a room with whoever was the guardian at the time or whatever, or the relation and sort of just talk to us yeah. both. And even if I couldn't have said anything or I would have just listened, it would have just meant a lot that felt like you were part of the treatment when you're the one who's affected the most by the outcomes of the treatment with, with yeah. your with your parent, right? And to have yourself go through a similar thing, I think it must be very common. But to your knowledge, is that still is it still the case where, you know, young carers and stuff aren't acknowledged yeah. even by the doctor or, or, or yeah. how's that going? Very much yeah. so. And I think it depends on how old they are. I think that for our younger young carers, even if they are the primary carer in the household, they're not included and it needs to be, it's very much a doctor by doctor situation. It's not a, this is the the whole thing is kind of understood. It's very much of if you get a great doctor, if you get a great surgeon or a great specialist, then they will include you, but it's not a system-wide thing just yet. So we'll see how we go. Yeah, I just think that they don't, not knowing, understand it's a holistic thing, right? So you're, what you're doing is going to affect the, the young young carer so why aren't you just at least having them in the same room does that have to say anything right just making them feel as though they're involved or acknowledged i think goes a long way yeah yeah exactly so i gotta say what's next for your organization little dreams it's it's very impressive what you've done as i said at the start like it's just so many people would love to be have done what you've done but you've put in that really hard yards for let's say eight years before you got that funding and that commitment to it so what's next for your organization where do you see it going Oh, so many things. Um, I, I think what's next for us is refining the services that we offer, making sure that we provide a really high quality service that improves the quality of life of, of young people providing care. I also want to shift the dial a little bit on government recognition, on funding, on systems. I, I'm really passionate around that identification piece. So working really closely in that space as to how do we make everyone know about young carers. I would love to walk into a room one day and say, oh, I work with young carers and everyone just know exactly what that means. And nobody asks me, oh, sorry, so what is a young carer? And um, and what do they do? And, oh, I don't think I know anyone who's a young carer. I kind of just, I want those questions to not exist anymore in our vocabulary. So that's what I'm working towards and that as a team, that's what we're working towards and also just meeting the demand we've had the demand for our services has increased by 370 percent over the last two years so just kind of trying to meet that demand and continue to be able to support every young carer who needs it around the country now is there a referral process for people to come and be involved or is it something how do, how do how do people learn more or how do they get involved Definitely. So head to our website, littledreamers.org.au, and there is an apply for support button on our website. You can apply as an individual um, or you can get referred through from a doctor, teacher, uh, psychologist, uh, social worker. If you um, refer yourself through, you just need to upload a document that confirms the diagnosis in your families or a letter from a doctor. If you are referred to from a professional like a teacher a social worker a psychologist all of that kind of stuff they don't need to submit a letter so um that's the only difference but our apply for support is on our website thank you very much may so i'll put the links in the show notes there you're a very busy person thank you for giving me an hour of your time it's awesome what you're doing like as i said it's, it's just massive amount of respect for someone who um sees a gap in the market but most of the time it's for making profit for themselves right whereas you've done it you saw a gap in the market to try and help other people achieve and to not maybe to have that support which you didn't have right it's a really admirable and amazing thing that you've done and hopefully we you know you get a lot more awareness and a lot more support from funding wise moving forward but i think it's absolutely brilliant what you've done and thank you very much for your time maddie so i really appreciate it oh thank you so much for having me it's been it's been a great chat and i can't wait to listen to it thanks maddie just stopping